Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to Michael and Phoenix Books and all of the sponsors tonight, and to all of you. It's really wonderful to see you all in this incredibly lovely space. Um, I just wanted to basically set the table a little bit, just get us oriented a little bit around Amazon and some of the changes that are going on in our economy. And I won't take too long, and then we'll turn it over to a conversation and then ultimately to you to hear your questions. Amazon is in many ways very familiar to all of us. You know, it's the package on the front doorstep. It's the store that seems to sell everything. It's all one click away. If you have an Amazon Echo speaker in your house, it's, uh, it's so efficient that ordering from it is like a passing thought, you know. Um, it's something that's in a way very intimate to many of our lives. But as familiar as Amazon seems, in a lot of ways, it's very invisible. It's as though we're able to see just this part of it that's above the surface, but what's really underneath is much bigger. And it reaches into all these different directions, directions that we don't even know about. And it has all of these implications for our economy. Amazon, I don't think it's an understatement to say, is in the process of reorganizing the commercial sector of our economy, and it has very big implications for all of us. But it all happens largely beyond our view. We tend to think of Amazon as a retailer, and that's a very easy mistake to make, because Amazon sells a lot of stuff. They're now capturing nearly one out of every two dollars that Americans spend online. They sell more books, toys, consumer electronics, and clothing than any other retailer online or off. But to think of Amazon as a retailer is to really misunderstand what this company is all about. And when I say that, I don't just mean that Amazon does a lot of things besides sell stuff, although that is certainly true. It produces hit television shows and movies. It publishes books. Uh, it manufactures a growing share of what it sells, everything from blouses to batteries to baby wipes. It delivers restaurant orders in many big cities. It underwrites loans. It sells advertising. It manages the data of US intelligence agencies. Amazon is one of the largest defense contractors in this country. And I could go on and on. Um, you may have read recently that Amazon is in the process of moving into the pharmacy sector, not only with the intent of distributing prescriptions, but also of managing prescription benefits on behalf of our health insurance companies. So I could go on. But the point I want to make when I say that it's a mistake to think of Amazon as a retailer is not that Amazon does all this other stuff, too. But it's that the role that Amazon aims to play in our economy is a level deeper. It's a much more fundamental role in our economy that it's aiming for. It's bigger than all of these industries combined. Amazon intends to control the underlying infrastructure of 21st century commerce. And there are three pieces to that. The first piece is the online platform. More and more of our spending is digitally driven. And Amazon dominates the sort of online platform for buying and selling goods. And the key statistic in all of this to know is that 55% of all online shoppers now start their shopping at Amazon. It used to be that people went to a search engine, they put in what they wanted to find, different retailers would come up in that list and they would go where they went. Now, over half of people looking to buy online just start right at Amazon. How did Jeff Bezos do this? You know, I mean, it's pretty a remarkable thing. A lot of the answer to that question is Prime. You know, Amazon's annual membership uh, service. How many, how many folks are members of Prime? Yeah. Um, part of the way Prime works, you know, it's a $99 annual fee. You get free two-day shipping and a bunch of other things, streaming television and all the rest of it. The, the, part, the reason that Amazon gets you to pay that fee is not because they want your $99. What they really want is they want to create a, a kind of psychological trick, if you will, which is that once we've paid that fee, we really want to maximize how much value we get out of it by getting as much free shipping as we can. And so what studies show is that once people become Prime members, they stop comparison shopping. They start their search on Amazon. 
Um, and they spend about twice as much as non-prime households do on Amazon. So Amazon is increasingly the place where people are starting online. And because it's, got, it's controlling all of that consumer traffic, one of the things that's happened is that all these other businesses, independent retailers, chain retailers, small manufacturers, big manufacturers, they're out there too with their e-commerce sites. And it used to be that they could find someone, could, someone could find them through Google, but that's no longer what's happening. It's like they've hung their shingle out on a dirt road and there's like only occasionally someone walking by. So they face this really difficult choice, which is do I continue to go it alone or do I become a third party seller on Amazon's platform? And many are now becoming sellers on Amazon's platform. It's a treacherous road because of course you're dependent on your biggest competitor and there are all kinds of problems that happen there. So the online platform is one piece of this infrastructure for 21st century commerce. There are two other pieces. One is that Amazon uh, it has something called Amazon Web Services. And they control, through Amazon Web Services, 44% of the world's cloud computing capacity. Companies, governments, everybody keeps their, da keeps their data in the cloud now and analyzes it, manages it, moves it around in the cloud. Amazon is the major provider of this. Um, and the result is that lots of pe companies that compete with Amazon actually rely on it for cloud services. Netflix, Condé Nast, which you know, runs a lot of magazines, Comcast, Nordstrom, they're all on Amazon Web Services. And then the final piece of the underlying infrastructure of, of the economy that Amazon uh, wants to control is that they're rapidly moving into shipping and package delivery. They've more than tripled the uh, square footage of the warehouses that they operate around the country in the last couple of years. Not only big warehouses, but they're building these sortation centers and these hubs closer to cities. They're doing more and more of the sorting of packages and organizing uh, that they hand off just at the last minute to the Postal Service or to UPS. And they're also just beginning to do that part of the job, too. So they're hiring third-party courier companies in big cities. They've got their own Amazon Flex program, which is like Uber. People can drive for it. You get a set number of packages, and you go out and make the deliveries for a kind of piece rate. And what analysts say is that Amazon is looking to take on UPS and take on the postal service, that they want to deliver not only their own packages, but they want to deliver packages for everybody else. And you can begin to imagine this future in which, as consumers, we expect the stuff that we order to show up, you know, basically instantly. And maybe Amazon is the only company that can make that happen. And as it becomes more, um, the service becomes less and more expensive for other companies that use UPS, well, they're going to start using Amazon. So now they're riding Amazon's rails in yet another way. So all of this is, you know, is a very powerful and lucrative setup. <laughs> because what, if you think about it, Amazon basically has the pipes or the rails through which commerce has to move. And what that enables it to do is it can decide, here are the most lucrative pieces of this business. Here are the goods that we want to manufacture and sell. Here are the services we want to provide. And we'll take that. And we'll use the fact that we control the pipelines to push anybody else aside that wants to get that business. And then for everything else that we don't want to control, we'll let other companies do it. And we'll charge them a fee to ride our rails and will essentially tax the rest of commerce. This is a very uh, powerful setup that they have. It's really unprecedented in a lot of ways. And it's one reason that Scott Galloway, who's a professor at NYU and a consultant to a lot of corporations, um, has said recently that on the stock market, Amazon is gonna be the first trillion dollar uh, company. Um, uh, and he says, and shortly thereafter, we should break it up. Um, it's another reason that uh, one of the most prominent Silicon Valley venture capitalists described Amazon last year as, quote, a multi-trillion dollar monopoly hiding in plain sight. And the word monopoly is really important here. Um, about 35 years ago, the federal government radically changed how they interpret our antitrust laws. And the result was that we don't really enforce a lot of our antitrust policies anymore. The consequence is that Amazon has been able to grow using tactics that even just a few generations ago would have been barred by federal authorities. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of what I mean. Um, 
So one example is that Amazon commonly sells entire categories of goods below cost. It's done this with books for much of its history. In fact, during Amazon's first six years in business, the company lost a staggering $3 billion selling books and other goods below cost. Competitors who can't afford to lose money like that went out of business, and it worked. You know, we, bookstores closed in droves, and Amazon now controls about half of all book sales nationally. Another example has to do with how Amazon deals with upstart competitors. How many of you ever um, have shopped or been to the website Zappos that does shoes? You know, you know the, sho the shoe retailer? So they got started sometime in the 2000s um, doing really well. They attracted uh, a lot of business. They had a different kind of way of thinking about commerce. And Amazon was watching them come up, and they said, we want to buy you. We don't want a competitor. And the folks who owned Zappos said, no, we're going to do our own thing. So Amazon proceeded to sell shoes at a loss. They lost about $150 million selling shoes at a loss. And this other company, Zappos, bleeding red, their board finally said, OK, we're selling. So Zappos is now owned by Amazon. They've done this multiple times. And this is one of the reasons we don't have a more competitive online environment. And I'll just mention, finally, a third example of the kinds of tactics that we've seen with this company. Um, as I mentioned earlier, many brands, many competing retailers have, have decided that they have to become sellers on Amazon's platform. They have to become third-party marketplace sellers. Amazon uses the information that it gleans from those sellers to compete against them. Some businesses do well, at least for a while, selling on Amazon, but there's no guarantee, and the stories of what can happen are quite stark. Um, there's been studies done by Harvard Business Review and ProPublica, a lot of reporting by Bloomberg and CNBC that have brought some of these stories to light. One example that I'll share with you is a, a small company called Rain Design. They're based out in the Bay Area. They're this small manufacturing company, and they make these kind of innovative laptop sedans. They're like metal. They're kind of neat. Um, and they've done really well. They've been selling these for about a decade. They sell them on their own website. But because Amazon is such a dominant platform, most of their business is through Amazon's site. And they were the top ranked. You know, the first, you go look for laptop stands, their product showed up first because they had thousands of four and five star reviews, right? One day they got up last year and all of those top rankings had been replaced by Amazon's own laptop stands, which looked exactly like theirs, except they had the Amazon smile. Now a big significant part of their business is gone. I went and looked the other day, and actually Rain Design is now back at the top of the Amazon search rankings, but I noticed if you look up there, they're now a paid advertiser. So basically, Amazon has found a way to extract sort of coming or going one way or another um, more and more of the economy. Part of the reason that regulators haven't intervened in these situations is that Amazon's actions appear to benefit consumers, right, especially in the form of low prices. But I think we should be really skeptical of that notion, or at least skeptical that it's going to last um, you know, into the future. I mean, we know that competition is really critical, that having choices is what protects us as consumers in the marketplace. And we can easily you know, imagine a future where a lot of the things we need, we don't really have much choice for, or Amazon is so wrapped up in that they really call the shots and call the prices. It's also true that Amazon has a tremendous information advantage when it comes to setting prices over all of us. They collect a lot of data. They collect data on how long your mouse hovers over a certain thing, what you click on, what you don't click on, what you're doing on the web when you're not on their site. They collect data about what you stream from their streaming service. If you have an Amazon Echo speaker in your home, as many households now do, they're collecting all sorts of information from the very intimate environment of your home. And we know that they make price changes all the time. They use this data in ways that it's hard to know, but are they learning that we're not very price sensitive if we're shopping late at night? Or is that when prices are higher? So there's a lot going on there that I don't think is uh, quite as simple as is always benefiting consumers. And they also steer which products that we see, you know, um, whether it's rain design, whether it's Amazon putting its own books at the top of recommendation lists and so on. And so we can see, you know, maybe a less diverse marketplace because we've got sort of a gatekeeper now that's deciding which products make it to the top and which don't. 
It's also important to remember that we're not just consumers and that our economic well-being depends on our ability to make a decent living. One of the conclusions um, that we really drew, that Olivia and I drew in our research in this report that we published late last year, which is um, a long report, but also very readable and kind of organized into sections, so you can kind of pick and choose what you like. Um, but one of the conclusions that we found as we looked at this closely, we interviewed dozens of uh, uh, small and mid-sized manufacturers and independent retailers. We reviewed a lot of the research out there, a lot of the reporting. And what we found is that Amazon's you know, increasing grip on the economy is really at the root of a lot of inequality. And there are a number of ways that this happens. One is that we've lost a lot of small businesses. You know, Amazon on national surveys is now the biggest challenge that independent small businesses are facing. And as those businesses disappear, it also has this effect on small and mid-sized manufacturers who say, you know, the way that I get my new products to the market is that I find a few local retailers who want to carry it, and maybe I grow business from there. But a lot of small and mid mid-sized manufacturers say, it's really hard to get noticed on Amazon. I, that's really not a viable way for me to grow my business. And so as the sort of ecology and diversity of the market goes away, they're really struggling as well. So we're losing businesses, which is an important source of job creation. Uh, it's a pathway to the middle class. But Amazon's also undermining our well-being through its impacts on working people. You know, about retail is this huge sector in the economy. It's about one out of every 10 workers is in retail. And as Amazon grows, it's displacing a lot of those jobs. And Amazon itself requires only about half as many workers to do, distribute the same amount of goods. So you think about that, one out of 10 jobs in retail and a model that requires really only half of those people in the future. And as it moves into things like package delivery, you know, we can see UPS, the postal service, these are union jobs. These are sort of last surviving corners of the working middle class and Amazon's replacing those with gig workers, uh, temporary employees. It's sort of labor model, you know, Amazon is very sort of futuristic in terms of its technology, but it's very 19th century when it comes to its labor model, um, and we begin to play that out. So there's a lot that's connected to inequality here. The last area that we explore in the report has to do with how Amazon affects the well-being of our communities, and really how concentrated power is a threat to democracy, ultimately. You know, we tend to think that the political universe is like distinct from the economic universe, you know, so companies can get big in the economic universe, but that's different from our politics. But really, you know, concentrated power in the economic world almost inevitably turns into political power, right? You know, we know this, Amazon now spends more on lobbying than most big companies, including competitors like Walmart and Apple. One thing that it lobbied for recently that actually just passed this last week was a provision in the defense reauthorization bill that would, over time, transition federal government procurement of commercial products to an online e-commerce portal that, if you read the language, sounds a lot like Amazon. How many of you knew that that was happening? $53 billion in federal spending at play. Anyone in here know that that was happening? No, oh, one person, yeah. Amazon knows it's been lobbying on that for months, right? And there is a, you know, so who controls our government? Us or them? There is a local dimension to this too. You know, part of democracy, part of liberty is living in communities that have a degree of self-determination, you know, that we and our neighbors collectively have a measure of say over our lives, over our future. I don't mean to say that there's no room for big companies or national companies, but having something of an economy that is controlled locally is just so important. More and more the economic decisions that affect our lives are being made in distant boardrooms. And as Am and, you know, in the case of Amazon, it's really severing the connection between place and commerce that's always existed throughout human history. You know, you think about how important our local businesses are for how often we run into our neighbors, the anchor, the vital part of our downtowns. Um, they're also really important to the tax revenue base of a lot of our communities. A lot of commercial property tax revenue is a big chunk of local revenue. 
Um, what happens when we get rid of all of that, when we begin to sever that relationship between the geography of the places we live and, and the commercial heart that then underpins that? I don't think we've really, even as a society, begun to, to wrestle with that. And all of these connections that we started to draw in our research with Amazon and kind of these bigger picture issues that I'm talking about, when we went and looked at some of the latest economic research that's been published, we found that there are a lot of tie-ins to that, that places that have a larger share of local businesses have a bigger middle class, they have more social ties, they have more civic participation. There's a lot to be said, and they also have less income inequality. So all of these things are really tied up together, and I think we've been looking at so much of this kind of narrowly through the lens of consumers that we've sort of forgotten all the other ways in which the shape of our economy matters. So I want to wrap up this overview just sort of returning um, to the beginning of my uh, remarks and, uh, and sort of this idea of Amazon. You know, what we see of Amazon uh, floating above the surface is in fact connected to that sort of package on the doorstep, if you will, is in fact connected to something with a far, you know, underlying uh, reach into all these different areas. We're going to talk more in the Q&A, I think, about how to respond to this as consumers, as communities, as elected officials. Um, but I want to offer a couple of initial points here as I close. One is that my argument is not an anti-technology argument. Digital innovation is a great thing. Being able to transact commerce through digital means, being able to add that on to the relationships we have with local businesses is welcome, it's inevitable. The question I think that we have to ask is how do we anchor those technological changes in a political economy that values place, that values relationships, that values equality, liberty, that values democracy? And the second point I want to make is that my argument is not that Amazon is an evil company and that that's the problem. We shouldn't expect companies to have our best interests in mind, at least not national companies. That's not their job, right? It doesn't really matter whether Amazon's intentions towards us are good or bad. The argument that, we've made, that we're making is that Amazon's dominance, the control that it has, is largely a product of public policy choices not just antitrust, but a lot of other ways in which over the years we have really favored and accelerated the growth of big business and you know, kind of undermined regional and local economies through very deliberate policy choices. So if we want to have a different kind of commerce, if we want to have a more competi uh, competitive, uh, more equitable, uh, more uh, in keeping with democracy, then we really have to change these rules and that's really where we should look. So thank you. Mm -hmm.